it's very very difficult for bjp to return to power okay it's just outside chance very very difficult i i think it's with 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 great difficulty they might touch about 200 if these people come back to power i tell you india secularism will be completely gone does that make you think that uh, probably prime minister narendra modi is one of the most corrupt prime ministers which india has had so far i think undoubtedly as i said this is this is the biggest scam in the not only in the country but in the world नमस्कार स्वागत है आपका न्यूज लॉन्चर पर मैं हूं नीलू व्यास मोदी सरकार के कार्यकाल के 10 साल पूरे हो गए हैं और 10 साल में जो अंतिम चरण है मोदी सरकार के कार्यकाल का उसमें तमाम दुविधाओं से वो घिर गए हैं दुविधा इसलिए क्योंकि सबसे बड़ी दुविधा इलेक्टोरल बॉन्ड्स स्कैम ने उनके लिए खड़ी कर दी है लोगों में ये छवि उनकी बन गई है कि वो एक भ्रष्टाचारी सरकार की अगुवाई कर रहे हैं इसके अलावा उनको तानाशाह कहा जा रहा है उनको एक ऐसे नेता के रूप में देखा जा रहा है जो कि लोकतंत्र चाहता ही नहीं है और लोग इस डर को मन में घर कर चुके हैं कि अगर मोदी तीसरी बार लौटे तो न देश बचेगा न सत्ता बचेगी न संविधान बचेगा इस तरीके का डर लोगों में है लेकिन मोदी जी क्या कहते हैं मोदी जी का नारा है अब की बार तो बीजेपी को चार सीटें से चार सीटों से ज्यादा बीजेपी और एनडीए को मिलेंगी लेकिन ग्राउंड पर सेंटिमेंट क्या है महंगाई से बेरोजगारी से तमाम दिक्कतों से लोग जूझ रहे हैं लेकिन मोदी जी कहते हैं नहीं मैं तो आऊंगा लौटकर और 400 सीट का नारा उन्होंने दिया है वो उसको पार करेंगे आज हमारे साथ एक बहुत खास मेहमान जुड़ रहे हैं और उनके बारे में मैं आपको बताऊं कि वो देश के जा देश के ही नहीं बल्कि विश्व के जाने माने अर्थशास्त्री है यानी कि इकोनॉमिस्ट है साथ में वो एक सोशल कॉमेंटेटर है और ऑथर है यानी कि लेखक है पिछले साल भी उन्होंने एक किताब लिखी थी जो कि वो किताब उनकी बहुत ज्यादा चर्चा में आई थी द क्रिकेट टिम्बर ऑफ न्यू इंडिया जिसमें कि मोदी सरकार की आलोचना उन्होंने काफी की थी और उनका एक परिचय और भी है हमारे जो दर्शक जो नहीं जानते आज हमारे साथ परकला प्रभाकर जुड़ रहे हैं जो कि देश की वित्त मंत्री निर्मला सीतारमन उनके हसबेंड भी है डॉक्टर परकला थैंक यू सो मच फॉर ज्वाइनिंग ऑन न्यूज लॉन्चर और इट्स अ रियल प्लेजर हैविंग यू ऑन द प्रोग्राम एंड इट्स ऑलवेज वंडरफुल टू लिसन टू यू और सर जो मेरा पहला सवाल है कि मोदी सरकार क्या वापस जीत कर आ रही है 2024 में और जिस तरीके के दावे मोदी जी कर रहे हैं कि इस बार तो 400 पार और जिस घमंड के साथ वो ये कहते हैं कि नहीं मैं तो सत्ता में आऊंगा क्या होगा देश का भविष्य अगर मोदी तीसरी बार लौटे तो नीलू थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर है hunch is that it's very very difficult for bjp to return to power okay it's just outside chance very very difficult i i think it's with 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 great difficulty they might touch about 200 that's my hunch oh. that is because uh, you know the electoral bond scam has main viewers ke liye aapko ek second ke liye rok rahi hu aapne bahut badi khabar di hai aapne kaha hai ki bjp ke liye is baar jeetna bahut mushkil hai aur bjp 200 seaton tak simat kar reh sakti hai that is what you have said that it's very very difficult the maximum figure they can reach is 200 seats yes okay uh, because that's because you know there is a there's a modi fatigue which has set in right and uh, the main reason for that is you know uh, mismanagement of the economy mismanagement of uh, the polity center state relations manipur and you know uh, the divisive politics moves into muslim politics you know the all these things and on top of that recently even the moral high ground that they are very clean non corrupt is also shattered because of the electoral bonds this is true the another issue that you have uh, raised is uh, the prime minister seems to be very very confident M- what i would like to say uh, neelu is that whether somebody is confident or not it makes no difference when it comes to elections i know people who have been very confident losing the elections and i know also people who are not confident at all they were very clear that they were losing but they won the election this is another one. and then about uh, 370 370 and 400 par let me say a word about that 
you know, if the Prime Minister and the BJP have not said these two things, you will be debating whether BJP can win at all. But because they said this, now you are concentrating on whether they will be able to get to 370 or whether uh, the alliance will get uh, 400 more than that. You know, for charts of power. But let me say this. If BJP has to win 370, how many are they contesting and how many have to, you know, uh, if they are contesting about, uh, say, 420, 430, because, you know, there are so many allies now. And if they are contesting 420 or 430, in order to win 370, what should be the strike rate? Did you ever, uh, you know, pay your attention to that? You know, is it possible for BJP to win 90% of the seats that they are contesting? It's out of the question. Possible, yes. But uh, what uh, makes Modi so confident? Is it because of the Godi media, which he has uh, by his side almost as a puppet? Is it because of all the institutions which are standing compromised, but they are standing along with Modi? What makes him so confident? You see, my feeling is that the BJP, including its top leadership, including the Prime Minister, they are living in a bubble. They are living in their own echo chamber. You know, uh, once you, 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 you control all the you know, channels of communication, you do not get to know what is happening on the ground. You know what is the rural distress? You know how 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 difficult it is how difficult it is now to get a job. You know recently there was a CSDS survey among the Delhi youth. You know about sixty percent of the young people in Delhi said it's so difficult to get a job in India today. And you know the ground reality is that because you know when in twenty twenty two beginning when. Uh, 35,000 jobs were advertised by railways. 1 crore 25 lakh youngsters have applied for it. People are willing to go to Gaza. Even though they even though they know that there is a war situation there. And you know you may not come back alive. But they are saying that look. Instead of dying here without a job. As long as we live in Gaza and get some money. We can send some money home and when we can... Uh, you know, spend it on our upkeep. That is the situation today. You How said, dire... uh, yeah, you made an important point. You were saying that uh, Modi or the BJP government is almost uh, sitting in an eco chamber and uh, they are living in a bubble where they are completely alienated from the ground realities of what is happening uh, really, uh, you know, amongst uh, the people, the common man. So my question to you is that uh, is Modi not willing to accept the real situation. And the real situation is that he has not been able to manage uh, the jobs. He has not been able to uh, care for the people, the whatever he had promised since 2014. And that is why he doesn't want to hear those real voices coming from the ground. You know, it's not that they don't know the reality. But <clears throat> the point that I'm trying to make is this, that they think that, you know, there are more emotional issues they can harp on, like the Ram Temple, Hindu-Muslim question, you know, the othering of it, you know, they are the enemies, you know, and if you are unemployed, that's because of, uh, you know, a particular community. If, if there is poverty, that's because of a particular community. They, they, they think they're under the illusion that, you know, they can get away with these kind of things. That is their confidence, probably. Otherwise, you know, it's very clear that they have not been able to deliver two crore jobs per annum. They have not been able to, you know, arrest corruption. And they themselves are now embroiled in a, the world's biggest scam, that is the electoral bond scheme. And uh, they have not but got the... You were mentioning about, Dr. Parkala, you, you were talking about electoral bonds. Uh, the way Modi government has been exposed, now there is a perception that it's an outright corrupt government. You yourself said in one of the latest interviews which you gave to a channel, uh, where you said that this is not only the, I mean, India's biggest uh, scam, but the world's biggest scam. Now, the point is that is BJP having an inkling that because of this electoral bond scam, uh, probably it might uh, prove to be its undoing and it might lose elections because of electoral bond scam. See, I can tell you that they are a bit rattled. I do not know whether they feel that, you know, this is going to be their undoing. I do not know that. But they are definitely rattled. That is the reason why for anybody from the government or the ruling party have not been able to come out with a coherent 
credible defense of it. That's one. The, the second thing is, you know, they also feel probably, and, you know, I, I get this uh, from the statements in the social media and other places, that do people really understand what is electoral bonds? That's and true. because they don't understand the nuances of it, we are safe. That is what they think. But I what I am trying to say is that, look, did people understand what, the, what, what 2G was? You know, People need not understand the nitty gritty of it or the details of it. But the sense, and Indian people are quite wise in that, the sense that there's a huge amount of money that has changed hands. And secondly, this government under Narendra Modi has tried its best to, you know, scuttle any revelation of it, to stop any revelation of it, in spite of the Supreme Court directing the State Bank of India to reveal these things, you know, they, they, why is it that, you know, people are asking questions now. No, but Dr. Why? Parkala, if you have seen one of the recent interviews which was given by the Prime Minister to Tanti TV, in that same interview, he said that the people who are speaking against the electoral bonds will have to regret after some time. Now, uh, how does one read that comment? Because that comment is full of hubris. It is arrogant. But then that's how he's justifying himself. You know, this is a very interesting comment that was made by the Prime Minister. Um, you know, I'm trying to decipher, decipher what exactly did he mean by that. Now, if he said that, you know, people who have objected to or opposed to or found fault with the electoral bonds, they will come to regret it soon. Does that mean that he includes the Supreme Court of India? Is Supreme Court of India going to come to regret it? Is the justices on the bench of uh, the Supreme Court, which heard this and which passed these uh, uh, directions, are they going to regret it? Is the Chief Chief Justice of India, is he going to regret it? Hmm. What does it mean? And I want to know that, look, what did he, what did he mean? Is it, is it that, is it that, you know, he's saying that, you know, any, eventually people will realize this is a very good scheme and they will regret it for uh, opposing or alternatively, is he holding out a threat? Right. To, me, to me, I think this is some kind of a threat that, look, you will regret for, for opposing electoral bonds. Now, on what basis... I want to quite bola, Dr. Parkala. I'm going to stop for two seconds so that I can tell you about your audience. You have a very important point that the interview was given by the Prime Minister Narendra Modi. He said that those who are talking about electoral bonds are talking about the same thing, they will be talking about it. तो डॉक्टर परकला का ये कहना है कि ये पछतावा नहीं बल्कि प्रधानमंत्री नरेंद्र मोदी एक तरीके से धमकी दे रहे हैं उन इंस्टीट्यूशंस को जो कि इलेक्टोरल बॉन्ड्स के खिलाफ थे चाहे वो सीजेआई चंद्रचूड़ हो चाहे सुप्रीम कोर्ट हो चाहे वो बेंच हो जिसने कि इलेक्टोरल बॉन्ड्स का फैसला दिया है यस ओवर टू यू सर सो दिस इज अ दिस इज क्लियरली अ थ्रेट इन माय बुक्स एंड यू नो टेल मी on what basis can the prime minister or the ruling party or the government can defend this when it's so clear that you know there was electoral bond and there was uh, a raid before that and there was a, an award of contract and after that or before that there's a substantial amount of electoral bonds given and redeemed by bjp this is one the secondly if there is absolutely nothing wrong on the part of the ruling party and the government, why is it that the ruling party and the government have tried so frantically to stall this entire thing? You know, they've stalled this entire thing for five years in the Supreme Court. And finally, when it came to hearing, they dodged, they tried to dodge one way or the other. They, they've recruited, they've brought in one of the biggest lawyers in the country. And... Uh, just even after the Supreme Court has decided and given a direction to the State Bank of India, just hours before, you know, they were to reveal, they went back to Supreme Court and said they wanted time. And time till when? Till June 30th, that is until after the elections. So why is the government trying to hide? Why is the government trying to stall? And even after the Supreme Court has rejected this, they even made three of the biggest business business uh, associations like Asocham, Fiki, CII to yes. write to the Supreme Court, not divulge the details. They wanted the uh, confidentiality to, to be protected. 
Why? No, but uh, Why? Not the no. uh, yeah, the I mean, quid, all these, the all these pro pro, The quid yes. pro quo is so clearly being established now, even, even when the State Bank of India refused to give the full details. You know, it was whatever State Bank of India has given so far is only partial. But Dr. Patel, uh, does that make you think that uh, probably Prime Minister Narendra Modi is one of the most corrupt prime ministers which India has had so far? I think undoubtedly, as I said, this is this is the biggest scam in the not only in the country but in the world. You know, I'll tell you what. I, I, I'll give you a, a, if you have time. I'll give you a couple of instances, uh, Nidu. One, one of course is the the frantic way the government. Uh, attempted to stop this one the second thing is that you know uh, you you remove the cap of only this much percentage of your profits can be donated to the political parties you remove that and then there were very small and very young companies registered two or three years ago who donated huge amounts of money where did they get them and those companies which are in losses they have also donated where did they get the money from those companies which had very meager profits, they donated uh, amounts which are much, much higher than their profits. Where did they get that money? Which means there is a, a huge amount of money laundering that has taken place here. And, you know, you have this in the electoral bonds. You can buy an electoral bond, but I can give it to a political party. You don't have to give it. But then in the records, your name will be there. But actually, my giver is myself. But Dr. Parkala, uh, there are a lot of questions, you know, when uh, for this entire scam, where does the buck stop? If you remember the UPA years, uh, the buck stopped at Prime Minister Narendra, uh, uh, the buck stopped at uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh's table. And ultimately, he had to bow out of the government. People voted him out. Now, there are a lot of questions that, you know, is, is uh, the finance ministry involved in it? Because there are a lot of uh, financial institutions with banks, whether it is SBI, whether it is RBI. That seems to be compromised or uh, simply it is Prime Minister Narendra Modi and Amit Shah who are holding the reins of this huge, huge scam as what you said is the biggest scam of the world. So where will the buck stop? Will the finance minister be responsible or will the prime minister be responsible? Who will be held responsible for this? Nilu, let us put one and one together. The prime minister in recently in one of the interviews, like Tanti interview that uh, you mentioned, he said it is his own scheme. And when a prime minister claims that it is his own scheme, it is go his government's scheme, and uh, happened under his watch. And if that scheme is struck down by the Supreme Court of India as unconstitutional, my question is, does that government still have the moral right to continue in office? The Prime Minister immediately within an hour after that decision is pronounced by the Supreme Court should have quit office. I'm, I'm so surprised that even after the Supreme Court pronouncing this scheme as unconstitutional, not irregular, unconstitutional, how can this government still continue in office? Number one. Number two, once this entire scheme is pronounced as unconstitutional, how can still the proceeds of an unconstitutional scheme be enjoyed by the political parties? I think I think immediately it follows that all the monies were taken by all these political parties should have been, you know, deposited in the Consolidated Absolutely. Fund of India. So uh, do you think that there is some lacuna with this verdict? Uh, it's like a half uh, justice done in this particular case because had the Supreme Court also announced along with that verdict that the accounts of all the political parties or the money which they have received from the electoral bonds, that should be deposited with the RBI or some institution or somewhere. It should be just kept aside. Uh, would that have made the verdict complete? I think so. That's that's a very logical corollary, Neil. You're you know, right. One thing, you see, you, you, no court under no jurisprudence allows proceeds of crime or proceeds of irregular measures to be enjoyed by the beneficiary, isn't it? So it should have been once, once the electoral bond scheme is pronounced as unconstitutional, then all the steps should have been followed. But, you know, given the atmosphere, given what has happened for the last five years, you know, this much is a progress. 
at least now it, the information is in public domain and people like you and me are able to put one and one together and yes. say when was the bond purchased who was it given to and what did uh, what happened was it uh, a raid by ed or cbi or it or gst or was a bond given and in lieu of that they got some contract right. it's it's possible now but uh, knowing the prime minister he is is very arrogant full of hubris uh what if you know when it comes to the real accountability as to who should be held accountable uh can he pass the buck to the uh, to the finance minister because she is the one who's uh, handling everything or uh, the banks everything come under her so is there a probability or what what you feel because i really wanted your view on this that how if the prime minister passes the buck on to the finance minister and holds her responsible for everything because i haven't heard from the finance minister too much uh, after the verdict has come except for that one statement she made uh, during a, a conclave by uh, a news channel where she was asked why she is not contesting so she said that she doesn't have money to contest elections but uh, anilu the prime minister himself had said in so many words to a tamil channel interview that it is his brain child Right. it is his scheme so if it is his scheme and since it the entire thing has happened under his watch his government is responsible because this is something which was you know uh, uh, publicized as a very transparent way of political funding so right. the buck stops with him not with anybody and nobody else no it but what about the signatures what about the signatures all the papers you know where where uh, where the banking transactions and everything is concerned obviously the sbi chairman signatures are also there but then what about the directions given from the finance minister's office because uh, there were a couple of rtis which were filed that where it was seen that you know finance ministry was completely in the know of what was happening and finance ministry was giving directions to the sbi and there have been couple of rtis which have revealed that i think the responsibility is with the leader of the government ultimately it is the prime minister who has to be held responsible he he has to take responsibility and you know what what i don't understand nilu is this when the decision of the government to have electoral bonds was struck down as unconstitutional how can this government continue even for a minute after that some can can somebody can somebody give me a rational convincing answer even after one of their acts is struck down as unconstitutional it's okay to continue can somebody tell me that no there is no logic you are absolutely right there is no logic but then you have a brazen government which tries to brazen out everything but with this attitude now people have seen what what the real uh, face of the modi government is who said once upon a time na khaunga na khane dunga and now here you have a government which is outrightly corrupt and as you said that he's one of the most corrupt prime ministers which india has had so what should be the punishment what does the rule of law says supposing if there is a judicial inquiry do you see any probability of prime minister narendra modi going to the jail you know uh, the 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 responsibility be, responsibility will have to be fixed one and the best way to fix a responsibility is because in the government is saying it's all it's, it's all very good it's transparent and what is the alternative and all that and they also are saying from the government side from the ruling party side you know how can you establish a link between uh, the payment of electoral bond and awarding of a contract or a seizure of uh, raids and all that That's then right. if they are confident about it what i suggest is let them come up with a a very independent unimpeachable judicial inquiry commission let them decide let them go to the bottom of this and then fix the responsibility no but who will initiate this will this be initiated by the supreme court because a government who is so reluctant and who is so brazen will obviously not initiate an inquiry against itself so will it be supreme court which will have to be proactive now in this um nilu this government this this party has come to power riding on the wave of india against corruption you know and as you said you know the prime minister repeatedly said na khaunga na khane dunga and they have assumed a moral high ground that we are a party with the difference we are very clean we are not corrupt and all that if if they want to stick to that narrative then it is they who should volunteer and appoint a judicial commission 
if not i think the supreme court of india should take initiative and appoint a commission because this this has to be proved responsibility has to be fixed um you know who paid is it really in in lieu of something is it as a as a quid pro quo of something it has to be established isn't it because the the amount of money is so huge number one number two every agency organization which is supposed to be independent you know they are all compromised it looks like including you know so far we all used to think that you know they're all uh, you know caged parrots cbi it gst ed and all that but what stunned me neeru is this that including the rbi is compelled to relax its norms in terms of a bank a private bank its the ownership's equity and a person's continuance as head of the bank after you know uh, relaxation by the no- relaxation of norms by the rbi and that happened immediately after the the electoral bond uh, which was given to the ruling party the bjp and after they were relieved uh, 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 you know redeemed what does it mean it means even the rbi which is supposed to be fiercely independent which presides over our monetary financial destiny of the country even that institution is compromised and it has not happened before now right. this tells you you know to what depths this government has sunk in it's very evident from what you're saying that the rot is so deep that we do not know where it's going to end and what is going to be the future and as what you said that if there is a judicial inquiry an unimpeachable inquiry then probably maybe you know some kind of an accountability can be fixed but we don't see the probability of that happening and now with the confidence which uh, narendra modi shows that he is uh, claiming 400 plus seats uh and he's going to return to the power media not questioning him there is a democratic backsliding in our country which we have seen minorities everybody knows what is happening against them what happens if this despotic and fascist regime returns to power for the third time uh, dr parkra i really want to hear from you what could be the dangers which india might face if modi returns to power for the third time you know uh you mentioned about the media not questioning and i think uh, the media which is not questioning the so called mainstream media uh i think it's it, it lost its credibility completely it is non mainstream the digital media independent media which is still asking questions and you know revealing things look, look at look at the way the the entire uh, electoral bonds issue is dealt with by the mainstream media you know when when there are so much so many burning issues like unemployment rural distress you know price rise manipur burning all these are happening you know our mainstream media was jolly well uh, concentrating and reporting on the pre-wedding events that is the kind of uh, you know uh, mainstream media that we have forget about that but you see you asked a very important question you look that what happens if at all i i think it's a very outside chance but if at all it were to return to power i think we are if at all this election returns uh, the ruling party to power again i think we are not going to see another election in the near future that's one the second thing is you know the kind of othering narrative that this this government and this ruling party has been promoting you know you, you your uh, your all your problems are because of muslims some minorities you know all your unemployment is because of them you know our population population explosion is because of them all this kind of a, the othering narrative the hate agenda that these people are propagating and these people are promoting if these people come back to power i tell you india secularism will be completely gone it will be a one nation one religion kind of a state not only that you know the the, the kind of dog whistles that you hear now you know usko maro if you want to live in india you have to say jai to you know somebody you have to follow one religion uh, you, you uh, this is one nation one religion one nation one language one nation one this one nation one that and the kind of calls that are being given of ethnic cleansing 
you know, have arms uh, in your houses, you know, mark those houses, economic boycott, you know, such things will not, and lynchings and all that will not be any more dog whistles. They will be shouted from the ramparts of Red Fort in the Prime Minister's Independence Day speeches. It will reach that level. India will be completely under recognizable deal. Just allow me so, to interrupt is, you, Dr. Parkala. Well, 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 one more sentence. You know, yes. what is happening in Manipur is likely to happen in every state throughout the country. That is the danger we are staring at. I was just wanting to interrupt you because you've made a very important point and for our audience just to translate what you have said. कि जिस तरीके से प्रधानमंत्री नरेंद्र मोदी ने एक अदरिंग की है मुसलमानों की इकोनॉमिक बॉयकॉट उनका हुआ है मॉब लिंचिंग हुई है ये अभी तक केवल एक डॉग विसल की तरह थी लेकिन अगर मोदी सत्ता में लौटते हैं तीसरी बार तो आप ताजुब मत करिएगा कि ये सारी चीजें प्रधानमंत्री के स्वतंत्रता दिवस की स्पीच का हिस्सा होंगे और उसका आवाहन लाल किले से किया जाएगा ये बात डॉक्टर परकला प्रभाकर on record is cheese ko bol rahe hain uh, but dr parkala that that's really a very very dangerous situation for the country but uh, do you see any chance of the opposition this time india alliance has tried all its efforts but uh, we've seen how uh, uh, the opposition has been subjugated politically as well as financially now i don't know how much spine they are left with though they are putting up a fight they say that they are ready to counter them but i don't know how much of it is going to manifest politically for them or in their favor so uh, what is the hope then you are saying that they will be limited to less than 200 seats so where does your hope come from you know nilo if you if you look at it as uh, you know modi versus uh, any other leader or bjp versus other political parties or bjp led alliance against other party led alliance then you know your your view is going to be are they strong are they able to put up fight is is that leader strong is that leader a viable alternative to the incumbent prime minister but if you look at it as not that but as you know bjp the bjp government versus the people of india then nobody is bigger than the people of india nobody is stronger than the people of india you know if people of india move any big leader can be crushed and to me so you are saying that modi can be crushed easily it, you are saying that modi can be crushed politically very easy easily to me it looks like the situation has now matured to that level where it is you know the prime minister and his party versus the people of india no but all this narrative of you know there is no other alternative look at the ads which are put out by bjp aapka dulha kon hoga if you have seen those ads which are put out by bjp all the india alliance uh, uh, political parties uh, the leaders they have been caricature as akhilesh sonia lalu prasad and there is a bride who is sitting though it i found that ad is a very anti woman ad but that ad very clearly says that who is going to be the groom of that entire barat uh, who versus modi that is the kind of narrative which they are building so if you are saying that it's very easy to crush this uh, narrative or it's very easy to defeat modi uh, how will that be done i mean will the people uh, and i'm i'm asking you this question with uh, with a responsibility because uh, whatsapp university which spreads the kind of information the kind of narrative which is floated by the bjp uh, will the people be ready to accept the fact that there is an alternative to the bjp and we also have to understand the limitations of the opposition parties they don't have the money they don't have the muscle power they do not have the wherewithal to reach uh, to every village to every doorstep so in this kind of a scenario where does this hope come from that you know he might be able i mean he will be crushed politically you know as i said earlier if you start looking at uh, you know the prime minister versus other leaders or the bjp versus other parties the bjp led alliance versus other uh, alliances then you get into this but it is no more that it the stage has passed that you know with the kind of rural distress with the kind of uh, you know very severe unemployment price rise china manipur and in a, almost every constituency in the country muslim versus hindu this kind of a narrative i think i think uh, a, a deep sense of modi fatigue had set in now are ho gaya bahut ho gaya 
thak gaye hain you know that kind of a thing has come because you see the point is this and and you know we must also understand you look that the prime minister is over exposed every where you see his uh, photograph every where you see his uh, pictures his footage his his pic you know his videos <coughs> and you know that kind of an exposure does good if there is delivery and if there is substance in it but if there is no substance the more you are exposed if there is no substance it is going to be adversely affecting your image and that is that already has started that is my feeling so do you think that 2024 is almost like uh, 2004 where we had the india shining campaign by the bjp are we going to see a repeat of that it looks like that i think there is over hype you see if you go on saying that you know we are we are growing at a at a very fast rate we are going growing very high and we are the fastest growing economy and we have we have overtaken the united kingdom and become the fifth largest economy i'll i'll just give you one one uh, example of this if you have overtaken the united kingdom you all agree that united kingdom is a, a developed country now if we have overtaken united kingdom we should be a developed country otherwise how can a, an underdeveloped country still be overtaking the developed country but then on the other hand you see on the one hand they claim that we have overtaken the united kingdom on the other hand they say that we will be a developed economy by 2047 why is what is this contradiction one and if you, when you say that we are the we are the fifth largest economy but we are 140th in the per capita income we are far far below and That's then right. and then and then you see you say that uh, you are a developed country you are uh, sab acche hai what 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 is that expression acche din sab changa si sab changa si if that is the case why is it the government has announced and implementing free ration of 5 kilos food grains for 82 crore people why is it That's on the right. one hand you you say that you know world hunger index is is, is nothing i mean there it's, it's only a propaganda against india but if world hunger index is is not correct why is it that you are giving so many people free ration for 5 years and 5 years at a time announcement needo you must understand see any government scheme any of these kind of measures palliative measures are announced for a year and see what happens after that you know how many people really deserve it should be scaled down etc but at a time in one go if the announcement is for 5 years it, which means that the government is not confident that they will be able to reduce hunger and juxtapose right. this with juxtapose this with the with the recent pronouncement of uh, the chief economic advisor the chief economic advisor had said that you know tackling unemployment is, is, is not the job of the government Yes. then whose job is that no that's and, what, that was very uh, indifferent and a non challenged comment but to, but to just uh, put things uh, a little ahead of what you are asking sir i mean you were you were saying uh, it's very evident from what you're saying and uh, the parameters which you have spoken about that uh, the modi government has been staggeringly incompetent as far as the economy is concerned but what i want to ask you and with all the humility i just want to ask you this question because your spouse is a finance minister but uh, and she is an economist herself she has a good knowledge of finance and here you have a prime minister who doesn't have any idea about economics he talks about uh, you, he talks about economics he throws five trillion figures like anything but the point is that couldn't have madam nirmala sitaraman put her foot down wouldn't she have advised the prime minister in better uh, capacity or prime minister ensures that no cabinet minister doesn't ever get to say anything how do you see this scenario because i know nirmala ji personally also and i know her economic competence but she's not been able to have her say in the modi government probably she would have advised him better or probably the things would have uh, maybe who knows it could have changed a little better nilu this is not uh, about individuals and their capabilities it is the kind of uh, you know the entire ideology and what the agenda of the prime minister and this regime you know it it has got a huge narrative behind it 
I think we need to, it'll be, it'll be interesting for us to see the larger picture rather than, you know, one X or Y or Z. That, that's not the way to look at it. Right. You know, uh, th th these are not questions of uh, a few individuals doing it. You know, this is this has been an agenda for the last hundred years, and it is it is uh, a, a continuation. It is a result of that kind of a narrative. One. Secondly, you know, I pointed it out earlier also. The BJP as a political party and the B BJS, the Bharatiya Janasang earlier. They have no cohesive, coherent, well thought out economic thinking. They just have no idea of you know how to handle the Indian economy, what Indian economy is, and where do we address? How do we distribute the resources? That is the reason why you know the, the last ten years, you know the the World Inequality Lab has come out with a report recently, you know very reputed, renowned uh, economist called Thomas Piketty, the, under his leadership, it says that India has become so unequal, the highest inequality, even compared to what it was during the colonial time. You know, 1% of a population commands 22% of the income. And 1% of uh, our population has about 40% of its assets. Inequality is at its height now. Why is that possible now? Now, you might say that, you know, uh, the, you are talking about, uh, the government is talking about $5 trillion economy. You know, let us also talk about, you know, the growth in the billionaires. In the 60s, the World Inequality uh, Lab says in 60s, there was one billionaire. There are now 165 billionaires. Who are those people? Why did they become billionaires? How did they become billionaires? Now, this government has perfected this art of, you know, throw about three gas cylinders or five kilos of, uh, you know, food grains at uh, people like you and me and give its cronies six airports, That's right. three ports. Right. You know, that is the kind of strategy this government is following. Right. Now, towards the last lap of uh, the interview, sir, uh, just a few, one or two lighter questions that uh, you, you do criticize the Modi government, its policies. But uh, have you ever been threatened, uh, uh, you know, that, uh, okay, ED will be sent to your house or CBI officials will land up at, at your doorstep? You never feel scared or threatened because of that? You know, um, since, since I mean, I've been critical of uh, this kind of uh, e economic policy, this kind of a policy for a long time. I've been writing. Whenever I wrote, I used to get, uh, and now it's more actually. Maybe after your interview is broadcast, after your interview is published, I'll get more. I'm, 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 I've been getting this for the last several years that I'm now used to it. And, you know, my some of my friends call me up. And say after seeing a video or an interview or a or a write up or, a, or an article or an essay, uh, especially after my book is published, you know people who are close to me who are my well wishes they call me and say that don't go for a walk alone. That's right. And there's so much of trolling, Nilu, so much of abuse. But it's fine because these these things have to be said. Um, truth has to be spoken to the power. But uh, I'm sure people would also be telling you or advising you. Generally, you know, society has a way of advising people that look, your wife is a finance minister. Don't go against the government. It's not for your well-being and all of that. Of course, you have your own wisdom. You have your own individuality. But I'm sure people would be talking to you in that vein as well. Well, there are so many people give me so, many, so much of advice. But you know, I've always been, I've always been uh, very steadfast in airing my opinions. And I've never minced words. If I, if I, you know, and and um, you know, if if I feel that something is going wrong, I would say it, and I would say it straight. I would say it blunt. I may not be harsh, but I would nevertheless say it. Nirmala ji has been a product of JNU, and I'm sure she understands what a democratic space is. Uh, I'm not talking about the regime she is under, but uh, uh, but but. Uh, you've never had a tip with her on this that, you know, why are you speaking against the government? She doesn't tell you all of that or you have your own uh, space in whatever you say. Neelu, this is an out-of-syllabus question. 
<laughs> okay. Okay. I won't push you further on that because I, I know to respect one's individuality. And uh, it's just that the viewers, you know, uh, the focus is so much on you for the wonderful economist you are, for the wonderful author, for the kind of books you have written, but also... Uh, you know, this sense comes in because you are Nirmala Sita Roman's husband. And that is why, you know, uh, I'm really sorry if I've, I've, I've heard the feelings by asking those questions, but it was just to connect the audience with whatever you wanted. So that is why I posed you those questions. So I'm really sorry if I offended the feelings, but uh, it is really a pleasure having you on the program, sir. But one last bit before I wind up the interview, uh, what would you really advise uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi? Uh, we've criticized a lot about his regime, his policies, but one sane advice you want to give it, uh, give him? Come clean. Come clean. That's it. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. It was wonderful having you on the program. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Sir. Bye, sir.